Hello everyone. Um, yeah, good evening, good morning, good day, wherever in the world you might be. Hi there, George and Eric. Uh, we're going to be starting fairly soon. We're just uh, waiting for everyone to come on board. We see the numbers uh, creeping up over here and I'll, I'll probably be starting in about 10, 15 seconds or so. Uh, we'll just wait for folks to, to connect on the side. But um, yeah, we're all, all ready to rock and roll. Um, on the New Zealand front. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we, uh, we seem to have most of our folks connected. So, yeah, good day, everyone. Uh, big hello from uh, Eric, George, and myself. Uh, thanks so much to all of you uh, who have joined us from all over the world for what promises to be a fascinating virtual tour through New Zealand. For the first time ever, we're actually broadcasting over two different days depending on where in the world you reside. This is also one of the first live webinars uh, that have been at a somewhat reasonable hour for our friends from New Zealand and Australia. And I wanted to especially thank you all for joining us today. I also wanted to mention that while we have tried to time the webinar to fit in with as many of the world's time zones as possible, we couldn't quite make it work for Nikki out in Mauritius. And given it's midnight there right now, we are thankful to have George Armistead join us once again. You'll hear a little more from George later on when he and Eric get stuck into all your questions. Right, on to the main event and the reason why all of you have tuned in today. New Zealand, located deep in the Southwest Pacific, the land of the long white cloud has had a difficult and rather checkered history with much of its natural avifauna and other wildlife, uh, which has struggled to adapt to the man-altered ecosystems and introduced species um, across the island. Thankfully, a lot of work and dedication has been put into saving many of New Zealand's native species, and there have been many wins over the past few decades. New Zealand is also home to an exceptional number of endemic birds and an incredible five unique bird families. Today, we are very grateful to have long-standing Rock Dumper Tour leader, Eric Forsyth, as our guest speaker and virtual guide. Together with his family, Eric has now called New Zealand home for over a decade, and he knows the country and its birds intimately. Eric originally hails from Scotland, but lived in South Africa for 30 years, during which he became one of Africa's most experienced birders. His expertise is backed up by a three-year nature conservation qualification, as well as several years of hands-on conservation experience at various national and regional game reserves. Eric began guiding for Rock Jumper now almost 20 years ago, and has traveled extensively all over the world, amassing an amazing knowledge of the world's birds. Well, George and I are really looking forward to exploring New Zealand. But before we start, just a reminder that we always love fielding your questions. So if you do have a question or just want to say hi, please use the chat function or the Q&A box, and we'll have a question and answer session at the end with Eric and George. And on that note, it's over to you, Eric. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And welcome, everybody, to the New Zealand webinar. With much further ado, we'll actually start the virtual tour of New Zealand. I've really enjoyed um, living here in New Zealand and doing the tours. Um, I've managed to perfect them and tweak them over the years. And now I'm able to find all the endemics that are available on this, on this route and many of the species that are difficult to find. So we'll start here. This is a map of New Zealand. And this is the North Island, the South Island, and right down at the bottom of your screen, we have Stewart Island. So why would you visit New Zealand? Uh, New Zealand hasn't got a massive list. The list is uh, 374 species. But what the attraction is about New Zealand is the endemics. And throughout all the islands of New Zealand, it's probably about 97 endemics, that's including breeding endemics, and that refers to the, the seabirds that visit all the outlying islands, like the Auckland and the Campbell Islands, and a few migrants that uh, winter in the Pacific, and that's the cuckoos. On this particular tour, there's up to 50 endemics possible, and uh, we see very close to 50 endemics, except that's including the Chatham Islands we visit there, and there's five possible endemics there. So nearly 50 endemics are possible on this route. There's quite a few endemic families and that's a big attraction to birders. There's six endemic families. You'll see there the wattle birds, 
And a fairly new family is the Mahuas. That's the, the white head, the yellow head, and the brown creeper, also known as the PPP. There's the kiwis, uh, five species, and New Zealand parrots, just the, the big ones, that's the kia and the kaka. And New Zealand wrens, that's the two species, the rifleman and the little New Zealand rock wren or South Island wren. And then the very unique and monotypic stitch bird, very special bird. So also on the New Zealand tour, we can see up to nine albatross species. That's quite fantastic. And we usually see them all very well. We average about eight on a tour, but occasionally we get nine albatross species. Also on the tour, we see three land-based penguins. That's going to be the little penguin, the Fjordland crested, and the yellow-eyed penguin. And the latter two, the Fjordland crested and the yellow-eyed, are endemic. So this is a map of, um, of where we go on the tour. We start up here in the, the Auckland area and particularly up at Snell's Beach. And it's, it's, a great, um, it's a great place to be based. The first part of the tour, we're based here for four nights. And so this is actually very comfortable. And from here, we, we, we venture out to different activities. We do a pelagic from here. We visit the famous Tiri Tiri Matangi Island as a conservation island. And we also do a couple of short trips to different places around the Auckland area to look for special birds. So we start off the tour on our first day. It's not, a, not an early start, about 8 a.m. We head up the west coast of the, the North Island. And our first stop is the, the Murawai Australasian Gannet Colony. And it's a spectacular place. It's, uh, we spend a couple of hours there. We see that at this time of year, the Australasian Gannets have got small chicks and eggs. And we spend quite a bit of time here watching and photographing because there are other species around. This is another angle of the same colony, the Murawai Gannet Colony. And I was looking at this photograph last night and I wondered, there was a bird in the center here. You could, if you look at where my arrow is pointing and I enlarged the picture, I was quite taken aback. Um, I don't recall if I took this picture to show the species, but that is a vagrant brown booby sitting there right in the middle of the colony. And I wasn't aware of it up until, until I looked at this picture last night. I have seen uh, brown boobies are regular to this, um, to this uh, colony, but that, that was quite a surprise. So that's a close-up of the Australasian gannet, and it's a very good place, uh, this Murawai colony, to photograph gannets in flight and on the ground. There's also many silver gulls breeding here. They're a very attractive gull, up to maybe 200 pairs next to the, next, next to the Australasian gannets. There's also the very beautiful white-fronted tern and very elegant looking tern. There's maybe up to a couple of hundred pairs nesting nearby as well. And all these birds are very photogenic. We spend a couple of hours, as I say, so very easy to get good photographs of these birds. Not far from the Murawai uh, Gannet Colony, we'll also visit a lagoon or a bay. And very often we find the endemic shell duck. This is the paradise shell duck and it's, this is a male. And just the next slide, that's the female, quite different looking, very different with a white head. Very good. We see this species just about on every day of the tour, so there's many opportunities to get good photos of these species. It's, as I say, it's an endemic species, but quite widespread. This is a variable oyster catcher, a very attractive uh, coastal species, also endemic, and we see these on many occasions. Um, very approachable, very easy. And this is uh, a picture of, um, it's two species involved here. The white and black birds over here that I'll show you here, these are South Island pied oyster catchers, and they breed down on the South Island. And mostly in the winter months, they, they 
migrate up to the North Island. And just for comparison, this is a variable oyster catcher on the right. You see it's a large, bulky bird. And then these slightly smaller, more delicate looking South Island pied oyster catchers. We'll see these, uh, the South Island pied, there's still a few in the north on this tour, but we'll find them mainly in the south where they breed on the South Island. And the variable oyster catcher we see throughout the tour, and so we get quite familiar with them. A uh, very special bird. Um, at this time of year, when the tours begin between October and April, we very often still find a few rival up in the north part of the island uh, wintering here. And it's usually young birds or older birds. And you can see the rival is very special. All the birds have a bill that curves to the right. And this is for feeding, when they're feeding uh, in the sort of uh, rocky, rocky streams and lagoons. They can get that bill under the rocks and you see them often gleaning parasites and other types of bugs amongst those rocky areas. So this is a famous rival. It's got a tiny population, maybe only of about five to six thousand birds. Uh, it's endemic, as I say, breeds on the South Island. And uh, while we're down there on the tour, we often bump into a few at their nesting sites. This is the New Zealand plover. A uh, very attractive bird. This one's getting into colour. They very often do get quite a bit brighter on the chest than this bird. But quite rare though, um, only on the coastal areas. And I would say it would be endangered because there's a lot of predators that take their eggs and chicks. And they can be kelp gulls, the stoats, there's hedgehogs. Very often um, predate the nests of the New Zealand dotterel. Uh, they're probably only somewhere in the region of a few thousand birds on the North Island. And then on the South Island, far south, there's a different subspecies, which breeds up in the hills, not on the coast like this species. And only a few hundred living down there on the South Island. So overall, it's an endangered species and warrants a lot of protection. This is a royal spoonbill, and we'll see these throughout the tour in many different localities. A very attractive species, very elegant bird. So this is a map of the Haraki Gulf. We're going to be visiting this area on a few trips. On one of the days, we'll, uh, the pelagic, when we do a pelagic boat tour, we'll leave over here, we'll leave uh, Snell's Beach and take the boat out here, Pascoa Island. And then we head up towards Little Barrier Island. This is uh, Little Barrier Island, and to the right is Great Barrier Island. Little Barrier Island, um, quite a few seabirds breeding on the island. Uh, Cook's petrels, uh, storm petrels, the white-faced storm petrel. Over here on the Great Barrier Island, um, black petrels breed here, and a few other different species, um, different prions, mostly fairy prions. But we, we come around here with the boat and tend to hang around to sort of the west and the north of this um, little barrier island. And here we, we sort of do quite a bit of chumming. And the main reason for that is we're looking for the very rare and endangered New Zealand storm petrel, which was only rediscovered back in 2003. And only in 2013, they found the first nest of the New Zealand storm petrel breeding on this island. So we'll spend um, most of the day, depending on the weather, we'll spend most of the day in this area. And I'll show you some of the species that we can see. Oh, so our first trip is to, um, sorry, this is to, I'll just go back to that previous map. We'll also visit um, over here, We'll visit this uh, Tiriti Mitangi Island. This is a conservation island. It's predator free. Uh, they've got lots of traps on the island. Uh, the traps on the island, just if any boats do arrive on the island, um, if, the, you know, come off a, if any rats come off a boat or a ship or anything like that, if you're visiting, there's lots of traps just to make sure that these rats don't start breeding on the island and wipe out the rare and endangered species. We spend a day here on the Tiri Tiri Matangi Island, and that's a fantastic trip. Um, there's quite a number of species we're searching for here. 
The trip out there is from the Bungaparoa Peninsula from Gulf Harbour. It only takes 20 minutes. So we'll come back to that pelagic shortly, but um, this is Piritui Matangi Island. This is a day visit here. And the first species it shows is the whitehead. The whitehead is uh, one of the endemic families, one of the new endemic families. This is the mahuas, and there's three species in the mahuas. The whitehead is fairly common on the North Island in different forest patches. It's still doing fairly well. And we should see many when we're driving around um, the uh, sort of the near for our hotel as a regional park there. We'll see quite a few in that area and quite a few in the central part of the North Island. But our first time will be here on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island and the small flocks fly around and they're very visible and obvious most of the time. Another spectacular species is the tui and uh, very striking with these feathers just over here you can see them hanging from the neck, the tui, very colourful bird, fairly common bird um, throughout the tour but mostly here on the North Island, in the South Island just in a few areas where they're common but along the east coast they tend to be missing. They're a very attractive and vocal species and we'll have many opportunities to see and photograph this bird. Fairly large robust bird. This is a spectacular stitch bird. It's an endemic and um, very beautiful. You see these white feathers next to the, just beyond the ear. When it gets excited these stand up and are quite spiky looking, very attractive looking bird, the stitch bird. And this will be, to let you know, just our, this will be our, really our only opportunity to see this bird will be on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. I do have a backup plan for a site further south on the North Island, but this, you should, should get this species. Um, it's fairly easy on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. And so that will be happy with that bird. Also, uh, the brown teal, also endemic and endangered. Um, the brown teal, probably only about 3,000 individuals. And um, yeah, we'll see quite a few different areas as a regional park we visit, as well as Tiri Tiri Matangi. There's usually a few pairs hanging out there and we should bump into a few brown teal. This is the famous uh, Takahe, very um, prehistoric looking bird with this huge bill. Very attractive in the colours, the greens and the blues. A very rare and endangered species, um, brought to many of the islands where they're, where, which are predator free and where this bird can start breeding and thrive. Um, they only occur really mostly wildly on the South Island up in the Murchison Mountains. There's still a, a small population of, I think it's 150 plus birds living up in the Murchison Mountains above Tianu. Um, but quite difficult to access. So quite a number of birds were transferred to predator free islands and this is our best chance to see the species. They can still be quite tricky if they're breeding but we very often bump into them at uh, Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. A very prehistoric looking species, the Takahe. That's another picture just to show you those lovely colours and the very large heavy bill. And here's a picture to show the comparison with the very common purple swamp hen here on the left. And this is the Takahe on the right. You'll see the huge difference in the bill size and, and even the bird is a lot larger and heavier. So that's a nice comparison between the species. The swamp hen is also very common throughout New Zealand and we'll see that almost every other day. Another special bird on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. This is one of the wattle birds. It's the saddleback, the North Island saddleback. Also highly endangered. Um, just a few thousand individual birds, a couple of thousand, and mainly in predator free zones um, such as Tiri Tiri Matangi and the regional park that we visit nearby. Um, there is another opportunity. We may see them on Kapiti Island. And um, yeah, a very special, very attractive species. They spend a lot of time on the ground, the uh, saddleback, and quite approachable. So we should get good views of this species. This is the red crowned parakeet. And we'll have a few opportunities to see this species. They're a hole nesting species, and um, 
fairly common species on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island and um, and a few other spots that we go to and uh, often get very close to them. They're fairly approachable. They very often feed on the ground, um, feeding on seeds. So we very often flush them from, from the trail in front of us. Uh, it's a very, very nice bird. If we're very lucky, we might bump into a, a roosting or daytime moor pork. Moor pork is the species of bubu cowl here in New Zealand. And the name moor pork is actually named after the call. The call sounds like somebody saying moor pork and a very attractive species. And I like this photograph you'll see here, it's almost the shape of a heart. And even the feathering looks like miniature hearts when you see it close up. We'll have a few opportunities just to look for the moor pork, um, mostly when we're doing nocturnal activities, but occasionally we do find them during the day. This is one of the endemic families, the New Zealand wrens. This is the rifleman. The rifleman is a tiny little bird. This is the male of all the green on the back. Uh, you see they spend a lot of time on the trunks of trees, finding food amongst the, the lichens and the mosses. It's a tiny, tiny little bird and um, we've got several opportunities. They do occur on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island, but they can be quite difficult to locate at times. But we, as I say, we do have a few places to see the species. This is the fern bird. Um, what a cryptic species hiding in vegetation. Quite unusual for them to sit up in the open like this. But um, they are on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. Um, there is a chance of finding them there, but um, we, have, we do have other places where they're a little bit easier. And a North Island robin. Um, fairly common on the islands, and we've got several opportunities to bump into the, the North Island robin. This is a, one of the other wattle birds. It's the North Island kokako. It's called the ghost bird. It's um, quite difficult to locate, even though it's only on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island, and only if they're giving off a few, few notes in the early morning, you can pick up that they're in the area. Um, so we'll, we'll spend a lot of time searching for this species. This is high on our list. It's probably the only locality where we can find them. And there's a few that breed on Tiri Tiri Matangi Island. And we'll spend a bit of time near water troughs when it's hot, because sometimes the kokako comes to bathe. Um, otherwise, I'll be listening out for the little contact calls, and then we'll try and track them down. Very rare bird, only about two and a half thousand individuals scattered on different predator-free islands. So that's the very rare North Island Kokako. The South Island Kokako is probably extinct. Um, hasn't really been seen at all in the last 10 years, but there's been different um, records of people hearing or possibly seeing them, but uh, no valid proof. That's a close up of the North Island Kokako, just to show you the wattle. So we'll go back to the We'll go back to the Pelagic and the Haraki Gulf. So we come out here from Lee Harbour and we head over here back and we sit next to Little Barrier Island and go to the west and to the north of the island. And the species that we're looking for, well, on the way we should bump into little blue penguins, uh, very attractive little birds. They breed on the coastal areas and rocky areas. Uh, this is a very special endemic, the black petrel, the breeding endemic. It breeds on the uh, little barrier, uh, Great Barrier Island, sorry. And we often see one or two birds, and uh, sometimes more, that are attracted to the chum. This is a flesh fruited shearwater. And this is one of the more common uh, birds that we see around the boats, the flesh fruited. Very often we see up to 20 or 30 birds. Uh, Cook's petrel, which um, breed on Little Barrier Island, we often see good numbers of these, and uh, very often they're, they'll sit in the water right next to the boat uh, for good photographs. This is Buller's shearwater. Um, they're around in good numbers, and they very often will land or fly by, giving good opportunities to photograph. It's a breeding endemic to all the islands in the Gulf. Uh, fairy prion, 
Uh, it depends on the time of year, but sometimes you can be masses of these birds out of the Gulf. Other days we might just have a handful, but we often see a good number of fairy prions. They breed on all the little islands out here. And this is the white faced storm petrel. We usually see quite a few of these, um, sometimes several hundred, and they very often approach the boat. Um, so we, we're watching all the white faced storm petrels, but we're particularly looking for the next species, and that's this one here. This is the famous New Zealand storm petrel. It disappeared uh, for many years and was rediscovered in 2003. And um, only, as I say, in 2013, it was found breeding on Little Barrier Island. And um, we don't see many of them. It can be from one to five, but one's all we need. And they're very approachable to the back of the boat that follow the chum line. So we'll be very chuffed if we can find a New Zealand storm petrel. And while we're in the sort of the Snells Beach area for those four nights, that will give us four opportunities at night to go out and search for the North Island brown kiwi at a regional park. Um, it will depend on the weather, it will depend on the birds, and we do often see one, sometimes two, um, but we, as I say, we'll have four opportunities to go out at night to close, close by regional park, it's a 20 minute drive and to search for the North Island brown kiwi. Very special birds. Um, there's five species of kiwi in New Zealand. We have an opportunity on this tour to see three different species. And uh, we've got to have a lot of luck with the weather and um, at night. And if we're lucky, we'll get good views of the North Island brown kiwi. Very mammal-like looking creature when they run away, very strong and very fast. Um, I very often use a, a red filter on my torch initially and that's just to it's fairly calming effect for the, the kiwis and that allows us to approach them so that's a very special bird the north island brown kiwi so from the auckland area we travel down next to Turangi. that's here in the central part of the north island and we go down there there's some special birds and fantastic scenery this is the tongariro national park and very often in October, November, there's still some snow on the mountain. And we're looking particularly in this area for the, the endemic and very rare blue duck. Only about 3,000 individuals still living in New Zealand. Um, they, they do get predated along the riverbanks, occasionally by dogs, but mostly by stoats and feral cats. And you can see they blend into the surrounding vegetation quite well. And I've got another picture here. And that's just to show you the end of the bill of the blue duck. It's got this uh, sucker, sucker pad on the end of the blue, on the bill. And that's for feeding under the rocks. As I say, it feeds in fast flowing streams like a torrent duck. And it uses this sticker on the end of the bill, this plunger, to find invertebrates and other creatures living along the, the rocks and underneath. So that's the blue duck. We do get um, one other, other opportunity. This is the main opportunity in this area, the Turangi area, but we will have another opportunity in the South Island to have to find this, this species as well. Another shot of the riflemen. They are quite common in the forest here. This is the male, and we'll be looking um, hard for these birds. Uh, the New Zealand fantail, this is just a great shot, so I included this one. We'll see this in many localities, but this is just a wonderful shot with a tail, uh, the New Zealand fantail. And th this is the tomtit. This is the North Island subspecies. It's got an all-white chest, whereas the one on the South Island has got a yellow chest. It's robin-like, the tomtit. You can see it's like a little robin. And uh, we'll have a few opportunities to see this North Island species, subspecies. At a nearby wetland um, in the Tarangi area, we'll be looking for uh, the, the New Zealand grebe. And um, we often see them at a few localities. That's an endemic. And the Australasian bittern. Um, there is a site with a large reed bed we, we visit in the early morning. And we hope for this species to take off from this large reed bed. And our success rate is about 80%, so it's fairly good. So, Australasian bittern, 
population is not huge in New Zealand, but um, they're often sighted around at different wetlands and maybe as many as 150 pairs breeding in New Zealand. So that's Australasian bittern. And one of the special birds that we'll search for here is the, the fern bird. Um, quite cryptic hiding in, in the sort of the grass and the reeds and the scrub. Um, but with a little bit of perseverance, we should eventually get views of the fern bird. It's endemic. This is the North Island subspecies. There's one also on the South Island, just a different subspecies. So from Tarangi, we're moving down to Kapiti Island. And uh, that takes us a good part of the afternoon to get down there. Um, we often stop, we, all, we have many comfort stops on this tour, and we very often have lunch at one of the local cafeterias when we're traveling on the tour. And so we should get there in the early afternoon, just in time to get our water ferry across the Kapiti Island here. This is our water ferry. The tractor reverses in with our boat. We, we're, we've climbed on board over here on the land, and the tractor then backs us into the sea, into the, into the sea itself the sea goes around the island here and it takes about 15 minutes to get across to the Kapiti, Kapiti Island and uh, we occasionally see um, a few bird species on the if, the, if it's windy we very often see white-capped albatross on the crossing, fluttering shearwaters and spotted shags. So that's the ferry to Kapiti Island. So we land over here, there's a ladder, we have one way overnight here, so we've just got our overnight bags or small suit, uh, suitcases and we load them onto a quad bike over here and uh, the quad bike takes the small suitcases and our bags over to the accommodations and we'll walk the trail which is only about 300 meters to the, to the lodge. If we're lucky we might spot some New Zealand pipits in this vegetation here but they can be quite difficult to find. So this is Kapiti Island. It's another conservation island like Tiri Tiri Matangi and has many rare birds uh, living on it. This is our accommodations, uh, little huts. There's quite a few of them around here. And in these bushes very close, we often find New Zealand pigeons. They seem to love this vegetation here and feed very close. And sometimes you find the pigeons on the ground. At night, you can often bump into weka, a type of rallid and little blue penguins walking across the lawn here. We'll also do a nocturnal walk at night here looking for little spotted kiwi. So this is the New Zealand pigeon and uh, very attractive when you get it in the right light, beautiful colours, it's endemic. Quite a large pigeon, they're very often as I say close to accommodation and not shy at all so you can get fantastic photos. Uh, red crowned parakeets are quite common and they fly around there. And this is a, a, our first introduction to the weka, a large rallid. Um, very confiding, very approachable. Um, should see quite a few of them while we're on Kapiti Island. And uh, yeah, you've got to watch your stuff. If you put anything down, the weka will be there and be grabbing at it. So if you put any food down, the weka will grab it. <laughs> You've got to watch your bags and your stuff from the wekas. They sometimes come into the rooms of the accommodation. This is the New Zealand kaka, one of the uh, New Zealand parrots. Very attractive bird, uh, very big and bulky. They're fairly confiding on the island. Uh, you can get quite close to you. They've got quite a large bull, so you're very careful of the... They don't really bite, but uh, you're just going to be careful of them. They'll often come around the accommodation and uh, sit on the buildings or sit at the main, the main sort of lodge where we eat our meals. It's a very attractive species, the North Island kaka. This is a shot of the New Zealand pipit, but um, we'll have to search hard for this species. They're difficult to find, but on Kapiti Island is our best opportunity. We take a walk to the coastal rocky area and um, occasionally we bump into a pipit there. There's a few other sites on the tour that we can try and find them. It's generally quite tough. And there's little blue penguins breeding on Kapiti Island and we often 
bump into them um, at night walking around. They, they, they breed under the floorboards of the main lodge, so you can often hear them. And uh, we'll hopefully see a few more with the, on there. And this is one of the star birds on Kapiti Island. This is a little spotted kiwi. Um, we'll go on a night walk with some local guides and uh, we'll try really hard for the species. They're fairly common on the islands, but still not easy to find. They're very wary of light and um, noise. So we'll listen to the instructions of the guides and hopefully we'll bump into a couple of little spotted kiwis. It's a very special bird. They're sort of scattered um, throughout the uh, sort of islands on the North Island, but extinct from the mainland of New Zealand. They haven't reintroduced a small population to Zealandia, which is near Wellington, um, but otherwise they're only on islands around the, the North Island. Um, they became extinct long, long ago on the mainland due to the introduction of dogs, feral cats, rats and stoats. And so next we catch a, a ferry across to the South Island, and that's a three hour ferry. Uh, so we leave here Wellington and go over to Picton. We drive onto the ferry with the, with the vehicle, 12-seater sprinter, and, um, and then we get off at the other side, drive a very short distance to our hotel. And so the next day, oh sorry, while we're traveling over um, on the ferry, the ferry over to the South Island, um, there's chances for a few, our first albatrosses of the tour. And this one is a solvens. And you can see a couple of them flying past the, the ferry. Uh, that's a, we'd be very lucky to find this species. It's a Buller's albatross. And uh, they're occasionally seen while we're crossing from the north to the south island. And we'll most definitely see a white capped albatross. They're the, one of the more common species. There's also chances of fluttering shearwaters. Uh, they're usually in big numbers, but especially when we come into Picton, we often see good numbers of fluttering shearwaters hanging around the, the bay. And while in Picton, we, we do a boat trip up into the Marlborough Sound. And the main reason for that boat trip is to find the endemic and rare King Shag. There's only about 550 birds and it, the population has been fairly stable at 550 to 600 for quite a number of years and out we go out in the early morning and very often find a few roosting sort of on the inner part of the sound um, closer to Picton. Um, the birds breed right out on the far part of the sound but a few birds come in and roost there and fish in there so we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, to find several of these birds quite a bit uh, closer inland. Very large bird, uh, very large feet. As I say, tiny population, 550 to 600 individuals. Also nearby, we well, should find the, the very attractive, this is in breeding plumage, the very attractive spotted shag. There's very often a small colony breeding not too far from the king shags. And uh, we'll spend a bit of time there getting close up looks at this very attractive species. Uh, so now we head down, after we've done our boat trip, we head down to Kaikoura. This is a very special place. This is where we do our pelagic, a very special pelagic, probably the best pelagic in the world. Um, we don't have to go out far. As you can see, this is, a, this is the coast, this is the trees, the mountains. Just to let you know, this is where the Hutton shearwaters breed, up in these high mountains. They breed very high up in the snow line here. That's the a rare and endemic Hutton shearwater. This picture shows a northern giant petrel and you can see how close they are to the land. So this is a really good pelagic. We don't have to go out very far. We go for 15 minutes and anchor the boat and chum because the seabirds are very close to the shore and yeah, so it's a great day's birding. We jump on this boat here. Sometimes it's a bigger boat, but usually it's this boat. We climb on and then we're sort of backed out into the to the sea here and as I say we go a short distance and spend some time there. We often look for um, other 
fishing boats because they attract a lot of seabirds, as you can see in this picture. And they're very close to the boat, very photogenic, most of the birds. This is a wandering albatross. This is one of the key spots for wandering albatross. We tend to see a few of those. A southern royal albatross. Sorry, that's a southern royal albatross. Very close views of all the big birds, often sit right alongside the boat. This is a Gibson's wandering albatross, that's the wandering albatross species we get here in New Zealand. And they're within touching distance, but I don't recommend that, otherwise they might take your finger off. This is a nice close view of the Salvin's albatross. So you can see all the birds very close, very photographic. Uh, this is a Westland petrel. They breed on the west of the South Island, west coast, and they're often seen on this trip. Another shot of a Southern Royal Albatross. And that's another one, very close. You see this black line that the, the Royal Albatrosses have between the mandibles. And Cape Pigeons or Cape Petrels as they're known. They're often around. And a special bird is the Hutton Shearwater. That's only on this trip that we see the, uh, here at Kaikoura that we will find the Hutton Shearwater. Um, breeds as I showed you back there on that first picture back up in the mountains. And um, yeah, we should see good numbers of these in the early part of the morning. And often there's dusky dolphins with us. They're very photogenic. They often jump out the water. They're, you see them at the front of the boat, behind the boat all the time. So very good. And so from um, Kaikoura, we head to Arthur's Pass, and this is slightly inland, and it's a forested area. And this is our accommodation here in the mountains. As you can see, even at this time of year, October, we have to dress up quite warmly. There can be snow on the tops of the mountains and a little bit cool. The days are quite nice though. And the bird we're going to be looking for is a very stunning kia. It's a mountain parrot. It lives up in the snow line. Probably one of the very few mountain parrots are quite happy in the snow areas. Very large bird, very approachable. It's endemic. There's only, it's only here on the South Island. There's probably only about 3,000 individuals. So um, we, we keep, uh, this is a very good spot, Arthur's Pass, and we should see a few birds around this area. Uh, this is one of the Mahuas, the Mahua family. This is the brown creeper, also known as the PPP. So we're up on the North Island, we see the, the, the white head. Uh, the, that's the Mahua. This is the, the brown creeper. It's also part of that same family. And yellow crown parakeets, there is a possibility. They often fly through the forest. Uh, New Zealand bellbird, which we should see in many forests, the North Island, but here, also on the South Island, many opportunities. And the South Island tomtit, also the, just known as a tomtit. Here on the South Island, they've got a, a yellow uh, belly, whereas on the North Island, they have a completely white belly. Now, this is a little rifleman. This is a female. So we've had a few opportunities in the North, but we also get many opportunities down here on the South Island. And this is the female with the sort of pattern like this. Another shot of the male, that's the male rifleman. Tiny little birds. We'll have a number of opportunities to find them. And if we're very lucky, Peramoa, um, often at this particular spot, uh, just joking folks, this is the extinct moa. <laughs> but um, yeah, unfortunately these birds are gone, so we won't be able to find them, but this is always, uh, always bring everybody here just to have a look. And so from the Arthur's Pass, we go down to the Omarama country, quite different countryside. It's a very open and grassy areas, and there's some special birds we're looking for there. We first stop at the St. Jordan Observatory and just have a look out over different lakes and the scenery. We look over the southern mountains where we see a fantastic snow line. And then we, on one of the days we're going to be spending is going to be here at Mount Cook. This is a famous Mount Cook very often in clouds, so this is a good shot of it in the open today. And we'll spend time here on the braided rivers, uh, looking for some very special birds. 
and in particular this species this is the black stilt a very very rare bird um probably the rarest wade it is the rarest wader in the world probably only about um roughly 200 individuals and there's also captive breeding done nearby these birds are released into the same area and to um increase this population they'll very often take the eggs of the wild birds and incubate them and then these wild birds will relay and then with the cat with bringing up the captive birds um once the eggs have hatched a few months later they release the the young birds into these areas to try supplement the wild population um, predated often by hedgehogs, feral cats, rats, and stoats. So there's a lot of trapping going on in this area to try and trap those introduced predators and get rid of them. This is a nice shot of a black, uh, adult black stoat. Very attractive species. As I say, only about 200 still living in this area. This is a younger bird. You see the white patches over here. It's not a hybrid. All the black stilts are bandied, whereas the pied stilts aren't. And very often mistaken as a, a pied stilt. Um, people come to this area and they see these birds and they, these are the young birds uh, that have hatched or been introduced um, from the captive breeding program. They very often say they can't find black stilts, but if they're bandied, they'll be black stilts. Um, the non-bandied birds are usually the pied stilts. So this is a young, black stilt and this is what they look like so a little bit confusing and as they get older they go to that with white patches all over the place and then eventually completely black another special bird in this area is the rye bull the rye bull uh, breeds in this area and we'll spend a bit of time watching these birds and black fronted tern we often spend time um, trying to photograph the black fronted tern, which breed in this area as well. It's also a breeding endemic, the black fronted tern. Uh, black bull gulls, another breeding endemic, very attractive species. We'll see quite a few here in the South Island from now on. And a very attractive double banded plover. Very special bird, and we'll see a good number of these while we're walking around in this area. We'll also see a few pairs of South Island oyster catcher. And that should be very nice. Just a shot of some lavenders. I thought I'll just take that just for interest. We do pass this lavender field, so if there's an opportunity, we may pop in. And this is the clay cliffs area. Another spectacular spot. We'll stop for a few minutes. If we're very lucky, there might be the very rare New Zealand falcon here. And so we'll just spend a little bit of time looking for the New Zealand falcon. In this area we have opportunities in the, the north island <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and the south island but at this particular area um especially in the south island is our best opportunity for the rare new zealand falcon that's a bird in flight and we see we do see a lot of swamp harriers in the area heck of a lot of swamp harriers throughout the North and the South Island. And some days we can see up to 20 swamp harriers, very common near endemic. Uh, great crested grebe. There's a few lakes in the area. We should bump into a few pairs of great crested grebes. They're just on the South Island of New Zealand. Very attractive bird. And another endemic is the New Zealand scalp. Um, many opportunities to see this species up in the North Island as well. But here in the South Island, quite a few localities. Uh, so from Amarama, we head down to Tianu, and that takes most of the afternoon to drive down there. As I say, many comfort stops on the way, and we have lunch somewhere. And in the Tianu area, well, it's very attractive. This is the Milford Sound. We drive around and, and on main roads looking for forested areas. Uh, we do a few trails in the area. This is a chance for blue duck in this area as well, along the streams. This is uh, some folks looking for rock rain, New Zealand rock rain, <clears throat> which is a very uh, scarce bird here in the South Island. And our locality, our best locality, unfortunately, is not available anymore um, due to avalanche activity in the area. But we do have another spot to try and search for it. And this is the 
This is the target we would be after, the New Zealand rock wren, also known as the South Island wren. It's a tiny little inhabitant of the rocky areas, and we'll spend quite a bit of time in this area looking for this, this little guy. There's also falcon possible in this area. And the kia, this is our second opportunity to see kia. They're quite numerous throughout this area. And very often we find them parked next to the vehicle when we're walking around. And I see another opportunity for blue duck along the fast flowing streams. From Tiana, we head down to Stuart Island. Uh, that takes a few hours just to get down to Bluff. And then we catch a ferry across the Stuart Island, and we may see a few seabirds on the route, but we often do see common diving petrels, and um, you see them fluttering across the water as we're heading to Stuart Island. It takes an hour to get over to Stuart Island. This is the town of Oban, and uh, we'll spend two nights here. Another shot of the town. There's a hotel that we'll stay at, the South Seas Hotel. It's just a 200 200 meter walk from the ferry and signs up to keep people going slow there. We'll visit uh, while we're on Stuart, uh, Stuart Island, we'll go across to Alva Island. We'll spend a bit of time there looking for the South Island saddleback. That's another one of the wattle birds split from the North Island saddleback. So South Island saddleback, they're fairly common on Alva Island. More red crown par parakeets opportunity and tui. This is just a good shot of a tui showing the, the feathers here on the front. This is a very large honey eater, the tui. And more opportunities for brown creeper in this area. And South Island saddlebags. And uh, we saw the North Island saddlebags, we see them up in the Tiri Tiri Island and Kapiti Island. This is a South Island saddleback and this is our best opportunity to see this rare species probably only 1,500 individuals at scattered islands here on the South Island. And the last of the Mahua family is the Yellowhead. Uh, this is really the only place where we've got a good chance of seeing them here on Alva Island next to Stuart Island. We catch a, we catch a little water taxi over to Al Alva Island and spend quite a number of hours there. And so we've seen the white head up in the North Island, the, the round creeper or PPP on several parts of the South Island. Uh, but this yellowhead is really our only opportunity is here on Alva. So quite a rare species. Probably only, probably less than 2,000 individuals left on scattered islands, at uh, predator-free islands. The South Island robin and a few, few opportunities on the South Island at different localities to see this. Uh, different subspecies of kaka parrot here on the South Island. Often fly around the accommodations, the kaka, and very inquisitive species. And other opportunity for weka, a different subspecies down here, a more rufous uh, form down here. Uh, more pork, another opportunity, especially at night. And then we'll be looking for the southern brown kiwi at night. Uh, this is taken with the uh, red cellophane uh, by the guide to stop the birds getting a fright. We'll visit a site which is very, very good for them. And uh, we've had a very high success rate of finding the South Island brown kiwi in this particular area at night. We also do a pelagic and um, a very large boat and lots of space. And it's a fantastic pelagic. We'll be going for the Fjordland Crested Penguin. That's an endemic, breeding endemic. And we should get few opportunities to find them. They breed here in the rocky areas. Uh, the very rare yellow-eyed penguin, um, probably less than 4,000. Um, there's a few pairs that breed nearby and we'll spend the time scanning for them on this rocky shoreline. So that's the yellow-eyed penguin. Also a breeding endemic. Favot shag, there's a colony that will pass and we'll have a good look at the Favot shags. They're split from the Stuart Island shag and Favot. And there's another one we'll see a little bit the next day. There's a brown skua that very often flies over the boat and 
catch his hand outs from the from the captain of the boat. He throws them up, and the skewer will catch them midair. More chances for common diving petrels. Uh, northern giant petrels are often around. As I say, loads and loads of albatross here in the south. Um, as you see, flocks of white capped albatross. Um, we chum for them, and uh, we often get hundreds of albatross. I think we had a uh, 200 odd white capped albatross in this particular pelagic, and quite a few um, of the larger ones, like the Southern Royal, good numbers of those. That's a Campbell albatross. Salvins again. Uh, Bullers, a very special Bullers albatross, um, mm. very attractive with this banana yellow around the bill. They're in small numbers, so we'll hope for one or two of those. There's a black browed albatross. Very attractive Campbell albatross with the stunning honey colored eye. We occasionally get one or two of them. And if we're very lucky, the Chatham albatross, uh, just occasionally, but I threw that one in just in case. I've seen a couple down there. Oh, this bright yellow banana colored bill. Occasionally we get the young wandering albatross down there on Stewart Island. And this is the young wandering albatross. Uh, sooty shearwaters, fairly common. White chin petrels. And if we're very lucky, a grey back storm petrel. We see them occasionally. And just now and again, we get the odd broadbill prion. So we'll keep our fingers crossed for this one as well. As well as grey-headed albatross, another rare one, but sometimes we do bump into them. They breed down there on the, the Auckland Islands. And so then we head up from uh, Stuart Island, we head up to Dunedin. And we spend a night in Dunedin. We visit this Tyaroa Head um, Northern Royal Albatross Colony. And we should get good views of Northern Royal Albatross flying past the headland. We spend a couple of hours there watching the birds. And there's about 20 pairs that breed on the Tairoa Head. So it's the only mainland population of albatross that breed in New Zealand. It's the only mainland population. There's also a Tago Shag breeding nearby. These were split a few years ago from the Stuart Island Shag. And we should see them fairly close up. And for those um, doing the extension to New Zealand, we fly out to the Chatham Islands. So we, 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 from Dunedin, we either fly to Christchurch, which is over here, Wellington or Auckland. And we catch a flight to uh, the Chatham Islands, which just sits out roughly out here, about 700, 750 k's from Christchurch. And for those doing the extension, we get three nights there. And there's five very special endemic birds. This is our plane, <laughs> the old uh, DC-10. Doesn't look like much, but it gets us there each time. Uh, the Chatham Hotel. Often find the Chatham oyster catcher along the shoreline here when the tide is out. One of the endemics, the very attractive Chatham shag in breeding plumage. That's the Pitt Island shag, another endemic. Uh, Chatham oyster catcher, quite rare, maybe only about 200 individuals. We usually see a few pairs along the shorelines. Uh, the Chatham pigeon, maybe are bigger than our um, mainland pigeon. And there's only one site for them. We'll travel down to that site. And um, quite a rare bird on the Chathams, only a few hundred. Again, they, they were devastated by the introduced predators such as dogs, feral cats, stoats, and rats. But the, the population is slowly coming back. And the Chatham Wobbler, we should bump into that in some of the southern forests um, on, the, on the island. Um, also making a comeback, um, not so many of them, but I, we've got a few good sites for them. And if we're lucky to get out on a pelagic boat trip, depend very hugely depends on the weather, because uh, the seas can be quite rough down there. 
we'll head out towards Pyramid Island and on the way we might pass a few smaller islands and if we're lucky we might spot some of the very rare shore plovers uh, which breed on some of the islands here. There's only a few hundred shore plovers um, on the Chatham Islands and they breed especially on a couple of the islands that we pass so there's a good chance we may see a couple of them. This is a uh, Pyramid Island, very attractive and really sticks out when we get closer. And this is where the whole population of the next species occurs. This is the only place in the world where the Chatham albatross breeds. And uh, population could be a few thousand birds. Very attractive species. And very often we see rafts, sometimes up to 80 birds just uh, floating in the water next to Pyramid Island. So that's our main target bird for the pyramid, uh, for the for the pelagic. But as I say, we will stop past some of the other islands for shore plover, and uh, maybe Forbes parakeet if we're lucky. I'd like to thank the following people for their uh, photographs for allowing me to use their photographs for this webinar. And that's the end of our New Zealand tour. Thank you very much, folks, for tuning in. Fantastic, Eric! Wow, New Zealand. It's a, a pretty, a pretty exotic, uh, special, special place. That's for sure. Sure, you really took us on a on an amazing virtual tour there. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, fantastic, Eric. Thanks so much, also for including so many um, scenery shots and uh, and what have you. It's uh, it's really great. Uh, Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm just trying to uh, start uh, start George's video over here for him. Uh, see if we can do that. Um, but yeah, some fantastic uh, fantastic feedback coming in here, Eric. Um, folks are saying yeah, thank you so much and fantastic presentation. Um, really excellent. Really well done. Um, Right, so just quickly before we get to, uh, to Q&A with, uh, with Eric and George, just wanted to let you all know that for our next Dream Destination webinar, uh, we head off back to North America and uh, more specifically to the states of Wyoming and Montana, where the focus will be on Yellowstone National Park. Magnificent natural area with a plethora of fabulous birds, um, great species, things like black rosy fringe, mountain plover, Williamson sap, sap, sap sucker, uh, both chestnut collared and thick billed long spurs, dusky grouse, uh, and so much more. There's also a whole suite of incredible megafauna uh, on show as well out there, such as gray wolf and grizzly bear and mountain goats and pronghorns. Uh, really is a pretty uh, spectacular part of the world. And to take us to Yellowstone will be a familiar favorite, a uh, rock jumper tour leader, Forrest Rowland, who resides in the area and he knows this wilderness uh, in exceptional depth. So that's uh, sure to be a fabulous virtual tour, and we do hope that you can join us for that. Uh, just a reminder as well that all our webinars are recorded and can be viewed later. Uh, those links will be available in the next 24 to 48 hours. We'll send those through to you, um, and otherwise you can always uh, pop onto our website and go to our webinars uh, tab, and you can view any of our previous, this is actually our 36th webinar, so you can view any of the 36 previous webinars um, from that uh, from that tab and, and follow the links to YouTube where you can see those. And just finally a reminder as well that the webinars are all being offered free of charge, but should you wish to donate towards our leaders, uh, our GoFundMe link is still open. Um, yeah, thank you very, very much. And over to George and Eric for some Q&A. Great, thanks. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, thank you, Keith. And thank you, Eric, for a great tour here, virtual tour through New Zealand, such a unique place, incredible to, uh, to see all these images and birds. And yeah, quite a few questions coming in. Um, one question folks had were regarding the magic trips um, and how, what the seas are like and if they get weathered out ever, um, you know, what are the sea conditions like on the pelagic boat trips? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, we've been very lucky. Um, I've done a number of tours and maybe 20, 30 pelagics. 
we've only had two pelagics cancelled out of 20 tours. And um, generally, depending on the size of the boat, we wouldn't go out if the seas were very rough. Um, the, the captain calls a shot and we tend to, um, we tend to go out when the seas are you know, pretty reasonable. And if, um, if people are taking medication, that's great. Uh, but if it's if it's if it's rough and quite a number of people are getting sick on the tour, we would actually eventually, you know, we wouldn't stay out longer than usual. We'd probably come back if a, if a number of people were finding it quite hard going. It's also a safety factor. Uh, you can't have people getting thrown around the boats. Um, so much, so far, the Haruki Gulf at that time of year, October, November, the weather is quite calm, and the, generally, it's it, we've had some very flat days. Where the pelagic species have had to sit on the water, they can't even fly. Um, so we've had, at uh, that time of year, Haruki Gulf can be very good. The Kaikura pelagic, we don't go far from shore. And so the seas are usually not that big. So we've had a lot of success there. And Stewart Island, which should be the roughest or the wildest, we've never had a tour cancelled there. Um, so generally we're very careful about the weather. And uh, we wouldn't go out if it was too rough yet. Nice. Yeah, I remember the, the nice one of the nice things about the Kaikoura trip is how close to shore you are and how short the trip is. And yes. sort of the birds per minute or birds per hour factor make it yes. uh, almost an ideal pelagic uh, for, for the more land lovers among us. It's, uh, it's a right. great pelagic. Uh, a couple of folks were curious about some of the seabirds. Um, yes. And, and you're, especially on the Chathams, um, you know, the rare seabirds there, Chatham Island petrel, magenta petrel. Uh, have you, have you, what, what's, how, how, have you ever succeeded with those birds? Um, you know, they're so rare. And what's their status in terms of their conservation? Are things getting better for them at all? They're getting fantastically better. There's quite a few dedicated um, individuals working on the Chatham Islands uh, with the tackle, the taiko, which is the magenta petrel and the Chatham petrel. Um, some very d dedicated men, um, uh, David Boyle works there. Uh, the population is increasing. This season they've, they're having a fantastic season. I think it's, um, I think I might be wrong with the numbers, but 35 chicks are probably going to fledge this year. And so the population is increasing. Um, our chances of seeing these birds are very remote. Um, you tend to, um, your best opportunity is to actually would be on the sort of the, it's a, uh, the next expedition that we offer. You go out, um, it's the whole of New Zealand plus the subantarctic islands and the boat stays off um, the back, the south end of the, the Chatham Islands in the evening and there's a chance of magenta petrels then or in the early morning. That's uh, the New Zealand subantarctic islands tour. We go out there, it's usually mid-morning. Um, we don't see a lot of seabirds apart from the Chatham albatross and a Buller's albatross. Uh, it's the northern Buller's albatross that breed there. We don't see many seabirds. And so, um, have, we've, and, uh, you know, uh, the size of our boat um, is weather dependent as well. So we, some tours have been cancelled out to the Pyramid Island. Um, as I say, um, chances are extremely slim to find one of those special birds on our trip. But in, in the New Zealand storm petrel, the chances seem to be getting better for that all the time. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, the New Zealand storm petrel we see, we've seen on every trip. And uh, sometimes we see up to eight or nine birds, uh, depending. And uh, yeah, it's, the success rate is very high for New Zealand storm petrel. That's fantastic. Uh, one question about the, the Chatham Islands extension. Um, yes. Karen was wondering how long, how many days on the Chathams versus what is the length of the our regular New Zealand tour? So the regular New Zealand tour is 17 days and we spend, it's four days on the Chathams, but it's the day, the last day of the New Zealand tour, we fly to the Chathams. Um, we spend two nights there, so two full days, and on the fourth day we fly back to the mainland. So it's two full nights. Great. Now, uh, here's a question for you. Uh, Susan, yes. come, Susan always comes up with some good questions. She says, <laughs> do you have to tell people about the musical toilets? 
perhaps you can enlighten us on that. <laughs> That's fantastic. Hi, Susan. Yes, the musical toilets. Um, so on our New Zealand tour, we do get many opportunities when we're traveling to visit loos. And some of the loos are spectacular in New Zealand. I won't go into detail, but they're spectacular. But there is a famous one at Picton, and I make sure everybody goes to the loo before we jump on our little cruise into the Marlborough Sound to look for the King Shag. And it's very special. And there's music playing in the toilet. <laughs> yeah. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Pretty nice, yeah. Very special. <laughs> now, if people look at the lists, you know, it's fun to, I, I like going to looking on eBird and looking at the bar yes. charts of some of these places. And if you look at the New Zealand list, you'll see the yes. front half of the list has a lot of seabirds. And That's right. The front half of the list and shorebirds as well. You guys really excel in those, uh, in those groups. Um, yes. Several folks were asking about migration and vagrancy. Uh, maybe can you can you give kind of a brief overview about any migration that might happen between the islands and any sort of migrants that arrive to the islands, uh, perhaps from outside the country. Um, yes, I think I'd be interested to hear about that. Yeah, so New Zealand is well known for its um, migrants arriving from Alaska, shorebirds, um, the Bartil Godwits, the Red Knots. And they come in huge numbers um, to winter in Australasia, but, but a good number winter here in New Zealand, um, many tens of thousands. And uh, so when we're traveling throughout on the tour, we do see good numbers of Bartil Godwits, Red Knot. And occasionally small numbers of sharp-tailed sandpipers and pectoral sandpipers. Um, New Zealand's endemic uh, waders, the Rybal, the South Island Pius, Isacusha, they have their local migration and even the Black Stilt. They breed on the South Island and they migrate up to the North Island during the winter months. So during the winter you can find all three species on the North Island. Um, the black stilts in lesser numbers because there's so few of them these days, but good numbers of rival nest in the north, um, roost in the North Island during the winter months as well as the pied oyster catchers. That's a local migration. Um, we've got a, yeah, on a, on a uh, rock jumper New Zealand comprehensive tour, we can see up to 30 pelagic species. So that's a pretty good number. Um, and we can see up to nine albatross species. On one tour, we did see nine albatross species, which is fantastic. Wow. On average, it's about seven or eight, but uh, nine on the one tour. Uh, waders wise, um, we see small numbers of waders. Um, they, people say that uh, the, the number of waders has decreased over the years. So we only get a smattering of Far Eastern curlews, um, a small number of um, you know, sm much smaller numbers of the other species. Only bar tails and red knots are in huge numbers. And what about, are there any land birds that perform any sort of migration? Like does the cuckoo, was it long-tailed cuckoo or, or? That's right, yes. And so the, the long-tailed cuckoo uh, arrives in New Zealand probably from late October through till about late February. And it's a breeding endemic to New Zealand. It winters up in the Pacific Islands, so Fiji, Samoa, um, all these little islands north of them, probably in the Cook Islands, there's good numbers there in the winter months. So from July, um, sorry, from March onwards, they're up in the, uh, these Pacific Islands. And during the summer months, we often see on our tours um, a few birds, especially in the central part of the North Island from about late October onwards, you see a few long-tailed cuckoos. Um, the other one is the Shining Bronze Cuckoo. That arrives in good numbers again from the north, and they arrive into Australia and to New Zealand probably from mid-October. And depending when they arrive weather-wise, we can see quite a few on the tour. That's also another breeding endemic to the Australasia area. Excellent. What about native mammals? Several folks asking if there's any native predators and I just you know and then I thought well geez there's there's very few mammals at all in New Zealand um, yes. maybe you could tell us about the there's a few native ones right and the non-native ones as well that's right so we only have two um, native mammals on the mainland and we never see them unfortunately 
It's two species of bat, um, long and short-nosed bat. They're tiny little creatures, very special. They, they actually often fly down onto the forest floor to feed on fruit that's fallen from the trees. And then somehow they manage to take off from the forest floor. But they're, they are both endangered and unfortunately due to all those introduced predators, uh, the cats, the stoats, the possums. Um, so they're not often seen. The colonies are known, but they're not well advertised. Um, and yeah, we, we haven't seen them on our tours. The introduced mammals we see throughout the tour and um, we'll often see possums, um, even, even a few during the day. It's an introduced species from Australia. It was introduced to the fur. We may see stoats introduced from, these are European species, hedgehogs, um, rats, and occasionally we see feral cats and they're all having a great impact on the, on the, on the native birds of New Zealand. And how about cetaceans and uh, sea-going sea mammals? Yes, um, I'd have to say it's not fantastic for them. We, we can see maybe up to three species of dolphin, the common dolphin, the dusky, and if we're very lucky in the Marlborough Sand, we see the very spectacular Hector's dolphin, which is an endemic species, a beautiful, tiny little creature. Um, but whales only occasionally, and probably the last couple of years, we've been very lucky. We've picked up a few orcas of Kaikoura and heading to the South Island. Um, so occasionally off Stuart Island, but not very often. So cetaceans, unfortunately, not that great. Okay. There's a question also from Constance about the kiwi. She noticed in your images of uh, the kiwi, yes. these long whiskers. Um, do you know much yes. about the, the function of those whiskers around the base of the bill? Well, what I've been told, uh, those whiskers, um, when they're entering their burrows, uh, because the eyesight is so poor, the kiwi, they rely on smell. Just for just a quick note, interestingly, the, the, the nasal canal is right at the end of the bill, right at the tip. And when they're moving around, because they don't have good eyesight, they rely on sound a lot and, um, and uh, smell. The whiskers um, sort of help when they're moving around in the bush from different objects. And if they're trying to find a burrow or a, a hole in a bank, the whiskers give them an idea what's going on. They can sort of feel where they're sort of going around. That's what I've sort of been told by the, the specialists. Nice, that makes sense, yeah. Um, how about, now, the, the, there's a lot, a lot of folks curious always about moas. Um, yes. When did the last moas die out? And I'm not, maybe some folks know that. I think one of the largest predators, uh, bird, bird predators ever lived, the Host's eagle, right, was yes. actually fed on moas, right? They had something like an 11 That's right span or a, you know three or four meter wingspan uh how how long it, how many centuries ago did you have to go back to uh to see a moa when we get our time machine eric how, how far back <laughs> have to yes go? uh there was records up till about the 1800s um the, the birds probably still survived then and the Hass eagle probably disappeared long before that because of um the Hass eagle probably wasn't a common species and because the moas were disappearing and especially the, the, the moas in open areas were probably easily hunted by um, the people that had arrived in New Zealand, um, the Hast eagle probably could not find food and disappeared long before the moa became extinct. There was, there was about 12 species of moa and I think there was quite a few forest species that survived up until about the 1800s and then quickly died out from local hunting. That's one that I like, yeah, if there was a time machine to be able to go back and see a host's eagle taking like a... a <laughs> That'd like, be spectacular. You know, yeah, We'd have to watch dinosaurs. ourselves. <laughs> exactly, that's right. Yeah, you have to be careful. Uh, yeah, yeah, a group of birders could be easy pickings, you know? Oh, no. absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's finish up by talking about uh, a little bit about probably perhaps New Zealand's most famous bird, uh, apart from the kiwi is yes. maybe the kakapo, the kakapo and, and how, how uh, what's going on with the kakapos lately? Is there, is there any good news on the horizon for them? And I think one thing folks um, 
may or may not know about New Zealand is the Department of Conservation has done tremendous work on a lot of these really rare things, bringing them back, the black robin and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the pest eradication on Campbell Island and some of the other islands. So while they've, they've, they've sort of snatched some victory from the jaws of defeat um, from some of these really endangered birds. And, um, but the kakapo, of course, is one everybody is hoping someday might be available for us to go try and see. How are they doing? Yeah, that's good, George. Yeah, the kakapo is um, doing, doing extremely well. Um, the population is up to roughly 200 birds, probably just below 200 birds. Um, it's intensely managed. Uh, the birds, the bulk of the population is down on Codfish Island, which is just west of Stewart Island. And um, there's no access to Kakapo to the general public at the moment. And the, even in the, the Haraki Gulf, where we, where we would have the pelagic boat off Little Barrier Island, is up to 20 birds there, but there's no access to Little Barrier. And um, so why I say the population is doing very well, a couple of years back, they had a very good um, fruiting season. The tree, the rimu tree, had a lot of fruit. The, the birds started um, producing chicks very quickly and um, a very good breeding season. And a good percentage of the, the chicks survived. And that boosted the population very close to 200. And um, it was about 130. And suddenly we had 70 odd youngsters. There was a bacteria that suddenly um, was spreading around from this fruit on the island and they lost a couple of young birds but managed to get most of the birds to veterinary care, most of the young birds and a few adults, and get them through this bacterial infection. And so very few did die. It was a very worrying time. But now the population is close to 200. And they do, they do have them on another island in the, in the sort of the Milford Sound. There's about 30 birds there. And the, so they've got population, small populations elsewhere to make sure that if there's ever a trouble on the main breeding island, codfish, that they have separate populations that won't get infected. Um, the only way to see a kakapo, I'm sure people are waiting to find out about this, is to volunteer to work on codfish island, which you can do. And I think the minimum amount of time might be two weeks or it could be a month. I think it's a month. And you may be a pot scrubber in the kitchen, or you may be an assistant in the field, but that is the only way to see a kakapo at the moment. Until, I would imagine if the population got to 400, they may eventually allow permits for groups to go see them. But that's a big but. Um, I think it would be safe at 400, and especially a separate population on an island. But uh, we've still got a few years to go before the population will get to... The kakapo doesn't breed every year, and that's the problem. And so we'll, we've got a few years to wait. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, it sounds like we need a couple more bumper crop years of, uh, of breeding. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I used to give a, a talk on, um, on mating um, in birds and reproductive strategies. And one, I would yes. always include the Kakapo Stephen Fry video. If people want a good <laughs> laugh, I recommend uh, go, uh, looking for that. On very YouTube. funny. Yeah, yeah it's a really very funny. <laughs> that is a funny video. Well, thanks so much, Eric. A, a really fun talk and a really fascinating place. Uh, thanks a ton. And with that, I'll hand it back to Keith. Absolutely. Thank thanks so much. Guys. Yeah, Eric, fantastic. As, as George has said, um, yeah, lots of folks really appreciated it. Uh, yeah, all your uh, expertise and um, yeah, I'm putting together a fantastic presentation. Uh, George, thanks for a great uh, question and answer session there. Um, and, and thank you to all of you, as always, for, for joining us uh, on these Dream Destination uh, webinars. Uh, it's been another, another wonderful, a wonderful one. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks time, uh, where it's going to be forest. I know Nikki will be back again. So uh, George, we'll uh, yeah, hang on, hang on to every word you said this time round, and we'll we'll see you back again uh, when whenever that may be. <laughs> Excellent, uh, Eric. Thanks again, and yeah, goodbye to all. Thank you.